Welcome to this new video lecture for the course Multimodal Communication. This is the second of five video lectures introducing the concept and research area of multimodality. The playlist embedded at the end of this video gives you access to all lectures in this series as soon as they are published online on this channel. This lecture presents and summarizes the content of Chapter 2 of the underlying textbook for this lecture. On about 50 pages, this chapter deals with the origins and inspirations of and for multimodality in quite some detail. We can only summarize and roughly sketch all these details here and mention and explain most of the keywords and concepts. In the first lecture, we discussed a comprehensive definition of multimodality, some typical examples from our daily life and professional context, as well as the main tasks of multimodality research. The aim of this second lecture is now to establish just where and how multimodality can appear. We will see which disciplines have responded to the challenges we saw for multimodality in the first lecture and how they use the term, or how they not use the term, but still deal with important issues of multimodality. There is in fact a huge variety of handbooks, monographs and edited collections that are all concerned with multimodality in one or the other way. The list here only features a rather small collection regarding the huge context of multimodality research today. Almost all of these books and publications show very well selected sets of approaches and disciplines and represent a lively research area with important ongoing activity and many opportunities for study. But for someone completely new to the field, the, que the question then often remains, which of these approaches are appropriate for a specific analytical interest or problem? Where do I find a good overview or how to analyze multimodal artifacts at all? Which theory or methodological approach will actually help me solve my problem and let me do efficient analysis. To answer these questions, we suggest to actually not start in your home discipline or within a specific research area you're familiar with, but instead to look at what we call the problem space of multimodality itself and to ask, what problems are being posed by a multimodal artifact? How can such problems arise and what do they involve? These questions aim at a characterization of multimodality itself and what we currently know about how people engage in meaning-making practices that involve various forms of expression. In doing so, we will lay foundation stones for any approach to multimodality that we try to apply or build, regardless of existing disciplinary orientations. Look, for example, at this screenshot of a tweet by Volvo Cars from 30th of March this year, used to motivate people to stay home during the current pandemic situation. The communicative situation is an interactive environment in social media, on Twitter, where the account VolvoCast shares content with their followers. According to the definition we introduced in the first lecture, this tweet is a multimodal artifact that relies upon combinations of different forms of communication. These forms of communication are, among others, the use of written language in the tweet itself, as well as the use of an image showing even more written language and the dominant blue color in the background. There's also the logo, as shown for the Twitter user, which accompanies the tweet together with smaller symbols, icons or details of the platform. All of them contribute to the understanding and interpretation of this tweet. In this time now, we will most likely not have any problems to understand this tweet and to think of the intentions and motivations that are communicated. We are all in this, in this same situation, forced to stay at home in order to hold the spread of the coronavirus. Volvo supports this stay home strategy with their tweet and asks people to not use their cars. 
even though they are known as the safest place on earth through other marketing strategies by this company. It is thus not only the language used and the display and design of this language, both in the tweet and in the image, but also, and most importantly, our current social and cultural situation and the challenges coming with this, that influence our understanding and interpretation of this artifact immensely. It is also of help to know a bit more about other advertisement strategies of this company, to understand the reference to what is meant with the phrase, the safest place. While Volvo, for example, does not use any of the typical hashtags for the corona crisis usually shared in social media nowadays, other companies such as Mercedes-Benz, for example, actively make use of them in their advertisements. Here on the right, in a tweet with a short video clip that thanks several groups and people in the pandemic situation. It is thus also important that recipients of the video clip know about the function of this hashtag and the messages that are communicated with it. In general, the video clip is much more complex than the static image used by Volvo, using many more modes or resources, or as we said, expressive forms of communication. There are thus plenty of diverse factors and details, both in the multimodal artifacts, as well as in and off the communicative situations in which these artifacts are used. And all these factors have to be taken into consideration when doing multimodal analysis. In order to build a strong general foundation to analyze multimodality, it is necessary to focus on precisely all these factors in order to navigate the problem space of multimodal issues. We have, for example, seen that materiality plays an important role for the understanding and interpretation of multimodal artifacts. There are distinct materials that construct a certain meaning, but also different materialities as taken up and organized by our senses. In the following steps, we will discuss which properties and functions of this materiality and the senses are important for our understanding of multimodality. We have also seen that language might play an important role in multimodal artifacts and situations, and we will explicitly look at the properties language provides for making meanings. We do not state here that language is the central or most important way of meaning construction, but we acknowledge that it has many properties that single it out from other forms of expression. Also, in many previous studies on multimodality, many forms of communication have been described as very similar to language or sharing similar properties. When it comes to meaning and meaning making, the very fundamental discipline of semiotics is something that cannot be excluded here and that will give us important starting points for our analysis. And finally, as we have seen with our two advertisement examples, society and culture play a crucial role for communication and ways of meaning making. And we will look at these as well in order to build a basis for comprehensive multimodal research. Our first starting point is thus materiality. And when dealing with material or materiality, we have to make a general distinction between something that is close to actual physical events or objects that can be identified in the world or something that is more an act of interpretation beyond the physical. We can, for example, identify typical properties of sound on the level of acoustics, frequency, amplitude or wavelength, which we can also measure as longitudinal waves. However, sound is not just sound or the hearing of tones, it usually also gives us information about space, hardness, distance or direction, and thus constructs meanings with and of these parameters, which we can interpret based on regularities in our world. This also explains why approaches that talk of modes in terms of sensory channels are often quite misleading. The meanings of sounds we hear are generally not negotiable. That is, we cannot switch them off. 
Even more complex are the expression forms of music or sound design, which are often used in combination with other expressive forms such as language, as in songs, or video, as in music videos. A few more details regarding sound, the physical acoustics and music are given in chapter 2.2 of the textbook. We can summarize here as we do there. Sound generally raises many potential challenges for multimodality and patterns such as rhythm, temporal synchronization or harmony should not be ignored when analyzing multimodal artifacts that include sound or music. A similar distinction between physical properties and perceptual qualities carried by a medium also applies to visual phenomena, for which we therefore distinguish between vision and visuality. Vision is anchored closely to light and the effect of light to the eye, while visuality considers all meaning-making processes. We will focus on the latter. Visuality has many different capabilities that are important for the description of multimodality. Here is a short overview. Images and other visual representations usually operate in terms of visual associations. We are able to recognize similarities in images in extreme speed and flexibility. And many media rely on our ready recognition of objects or people that we have seen elsewhere before. We will, for example, quickly realize the now very typical display of the coronavirus in the image at the top of this slide without any further explanation or context. In contrast to language, visual depictions usually do not construct their meaning by just adding the meanings of their constitutive parts, what would be understood as the principle of compositionality. Instead, there are other principles involved, such as those explained by Gestalt psychology. We recognize a particular form or motive, such as the depiction of the man in the image here, not by picking out parts and building these into a whole, but instead by recognizing a whole and using this as a bridge to determine parts. A further well-discussed capability of visuality is that of resemblance. We can state that the image of the man here resembles an actual man even though we can ask how exactly this resemblance is to be found. Do all men have beards? We could also say that the visual depiction of the virus somehow resembles the spiky projections on the surface of the virus when viewed under a microscope. But how far does this resemblance really go and how much of it is lost in the designing of this image? Addressing these questions is certainly important when engaging with pictorial artifacts and visual depictions of all kinds. Another interesting question currently of particular interest in the context of visual and multimodal studies is whether visuals can assert or lie, and many argue that they cannot. This means that images cannot propose an idea that is true or false. They cannot have propositions. We will not discuss this in further detail here and come back to it only when we have a more detailed definition of the semiotic mode and a better understanding of the contextual interpretation needed for every multimodal artifact. Keep in mind for now that it is always an important aspect of multimodal analysis to ask for the expressive functions and power of the semiotic elements in a multimodal ensemble. Now moving to language as a second important factor, we can easily find similar capabilities and properties that are said to overlap with other expressive forms. It has, for example, been a long tradition to describe films and similar audiovisual artifacts as being very similar to language or to describe a certain grammar for visual images or comics. While a critical discussion of these strategies is also of particular interest for our multimodal perspective, we will focus more on the disciplines and research areas that are centrally concerned with language in some way and pick out the challenges and opportunities that they have for multimodal analysis. There is first of all the huge area of face-to-face -face conversation. As was highlighted in the first lecture already, spoken language and dialogues, for example, does not consist of simply pronounced renderings of the written forms but they also include stress, rhythm or intonation, and they are accompanied by gestures, facial expression, 
and body movements. These components of spoken language are strongly multimodal and every analytical approach needs to address these diverse but combined strands of communicative behavior. Interaction and dialogues is also a topic of human computer interaction or HCI, where we can actually find some of the most detailed and exploratory investigations of how modes can be combined in the service of communication. Even though the whole area has long moved far beyond language, the current trends of exploring tactile or haptic forms of communication, virtual environments or embodied interaction become even more important for multimodal analyses of media that use these forms and environments. The discipline of literary studies has also engaged with a very broad range of artifacts and performances that are extremely challenging multimodally. As we know, verbal art and art in general is always concerned with breaking and stretching boundaries. The diversity of experimentation we find in the broad field of literature thus always also touches issues of multimodality, such as, for example, in the development of literary hypertext or many other possibilities brought by the so-called new media. We will come back to this when discussing further examples. Strongly connected to the area of face-to-face -face conversation, but not specifically addressing spoken language only, are approaches within linguistics that have broadened their interest beyond words and sentences. While looking at combinations of text and images, these approaches aimed at extending notions developed for the description of language and applying them to other forms of communication. This is where the grammar of visual design was born, one of the groundbreaking and most influential publications by Gunther Kress and Theo van Leeuwen that is still quoted and used by many multimodal researchers today. The broad reach of this book and the approach is also based on the linguistic methods the authors drew upon and that mainly come from the area of systemic functional linguistics, SFL. Within this theory, language is always seen as functioning within a social context and at the same time as being shaped by this contextualization. Therefore, language and then also other semiotic modes are described with the help of three very general communicative functions so-called meter functions, which are meter to any particular instance of communication. Further important influences from the discipline of linguistics come from discourse analysis, as we will see in later lectures. And here is again the book I mentioned, Chris and van Leeuwen reading images, the grammar of visual design, published first in 1990, then in 1996, and a second edition in 2006. Semiotics, the third strand we are looking at here, is actually very strongly connected to linguistics, since verbal signs, the vehicles of our language to produce meaning, have always been an important object of research in semiotics. Besides these verbal signs, however, all other sign vehicles and expressive forms are also of similar interest for this discipline. We can therefore describe it as considering how meaning of any kind whatsoever can be made through the use and exchange of meaning-bearing vehicles. Two important topics of semiotics that are connected to two important names in their works have to be mentioned here. On the one hand, there is the work by the linguist Ferdinand de Saussure on the verbal sign that is seen as one of the most important foundations for both linguistics and semiotics. On the other hand, there is the work by the philosopher Charles Sanders Peirce, whose foundations can be used for discussing signs of all kinds, and which are thus also of particular interest for multimodal research. What we can really only roughly summarize here by giving some keywords and key concepts are the most important aspects of these works. All of them are explained and discussed in more detail in chapter 2.5 of the textbook. Both Saussure and Peirce developed notions and definitions of the sign and of the processes of sign making. Saussure, on the one hand, focuses entirely on verbal signs that he describes in a binary model with the signifier and the signified as the two sides and their relation being arbitrary and conventional. 
Peirce, on the other hand, developed a three-way model of the sign, including also the level of an interpretant and with precise ideas about active sign making and interpretation. These are exactly the aspects to which we will get back in later lectures in further detail. Peirce is also very famous for his distinction of several sign types, among which those of the icon, the index and the symbol are very popular. There is one further particularly important contribution of Peirce's account that is crucial for the definition of semiotic modes and thus for one of the most central topics in multimodality. To work out interpretations of signs and meaning-making elements, Peirce introduced a third form of logical reasoning besides the more traditional principles of deduction and induction. This third form is called abduction and it is often described as reasoning to the best explanation. This means that in the process of logically reasoning about some meaning, hypotheses are built on the basis of certain information available. But these hypotheses might be proven wrong when new information is becoming available. For interpretations of meanings that, is made, that are made by multiple resources or modes, this is an essential aspect for the actual process of sign reading and interpretation. A short example. Abduction can, for example, be used to combine the contributing parts of an image or to relate text and image to each other. Looking at the two images used in this slide, for example, we quickly hypothesize that the two images show the two founding fathers of semiotics, even without any further explanation or a precise verbal information for these images. We build these hypotheses on the other verbal information available on this slide and on the basis of the logical explanation that the positioning of the images next to the names does not really allow any other plausible interpretation. To the best of our knowledge about the layout of these slides, it would just not be very feasible to put Saussure's profile picture next to the name of Charles Sanders' purse. Even without fully knowing whether the image really shows Ferdinand de Saussure, we assume here on the basis of the other information and because it is put next to the name, that this is the portrait of the linguist Ferdinand de Saussure. What we've seen already by only pointing to very small details of Saussure and Peirce's work is that signs and the processes of sign making can be considered from various perspectives. And the multimodal perspective is, in fact, again, a bit different to the semiotic perspective, even though strongly based on it. We see this in many definitions of multimodality and meaning making, such as the one which we already quoted in the first lecture. Gunter Kress and Theo van Leeuwen see the multimodal resources which are available in a culture used to make meanings in any and every sign, at every level and in any mode. And they see multimodal texts as making meaning in multiple articulations. The traditional definitions of signs are thus only partially valid for multimodality, and the notion of semiotic mode instead of sign is preferred. We will come to this notion in full detail in the following lectures. The last perspective to be addressed here is sociological in orientation and very relevant for questions of multimodality. A central sociological construct is that of the communicative action, which is often seen as holding the complex constructions of society and culture together. While originally always conceived with reference to verbal language, these communicative actions are nowadays similarly constructed by other modes than language and therefore become of interest for multimodality research. Questions then focus on the nature of communication in society and its structural consequences for the development of society configurations, for example. Within these configurations, media play of course an important role, particularly with regard to the fact that the use of media must now be seen as interpenetrating every aspect of our everyday life a process that is called mediatization. The concept of mediatization is used to analyze the interrelation between changes in media and communications on the one hand 
and the changes in culture and society on the other, as Nick Caldry and Andreas Hepp highlight in the introduction to this topic. This view on the role and consequences of media use is an important background for all further discussions of multimodal communication in these lectures. We thus see it as beneficial to draw on multimodal analyses with respect to media use, as we point out at the end of chapter 2. With this, we do not separate media from semiotic modes, but rather see communicative forms in their multimodal breadth as the basic building blocks of society. Media are bundles of semiotic modes and offer an interface to considerations of society, institutions, distribution and technology. Modes within these media are responsible for and capable of the processes of meaning making. With this overview of the four important strands, we have started setting out a foundational scaffold for the problem space of multimodality. You should now have a rough overview of the disciplines in which concerns of multimodality have been discussed, both centrally or peripherally, and which have led to many different positions and domains stretched out to even more disciplines and research areas. All of these individual discipline developments offer important parts of the overall puzzle of multimodality. But we also need more foundational contributions for bringing out the constitutive properties of multimodality as such, as a phenomenon in its own right. This means that we need to uncover more of the mechanisms and principles of multimodality in general in order to draw effective connections between and across disciplinary approaches. This is what we will be doing in the next lectures. Before we come to an end here, though, I would like to demonstrate the diversity we have seen for the origins and inspirations for multimodality with another short example. Think about a situation like the one shown in this image, where you sit together with your colleague to prepare a presentation or a report for your class. You talk to each other while at the same time using pen and paper and one or several devices to look things up, making notes and putting files together. Maybe another colleague is joining you via a video conference. In a way, this situation is very similar to the starting example in our textbook, showing everyday contemporary restaurant interactions. Here it is everyday contemporary student or business interaction, thus a somewhat different genre with many similar techniques and forms of expressions used within the group. As we said just a few minutes ago, Face-to-face -face conversations such as these are an area addressed by several disciplines, most of which we discussed in this lecture. We also talked about the different media and technological devices displaying other media and information in various ways. Here the level of materiality plays an important role in order to be able to distinguish the various media and expressive forms from each other. Semiotic comes into play to analyze the meaning-making behavior of the students, and the situation is also of sociological interest with regard to how the use of these different devices in media influences the communicative actions in the social group of students. Each of these diverse aspects thus draws potentially on different disciplinary backgrounds, picking out facets of the situation that actually needs to be seen as a unified multimodal activity in its own right. In order to find out more about this unified activity, how it works, how we understand each other, a comprehensive analysis of this communicative situation has to look at many different layers at work. These are not only the language and gestures used by the two interactants here, but also the various information offerings and interaction possibilities present on the devices, and the ways the interactants communicate with each other about and with the information displayed. A simple description of a combination of media and modes is, however, not sufficient. What is communicated how, in which modes, makes a difference? And the further question is, what can be communicated in specific modes? We will continue learning more about ways of addressing and answering these questions effectively in the next lectures. In this spirit, 
Thank you for your attention and see you for lecture three.